Good morning or afternoon to everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Scott Fish. I'm on the West Coast. Uh, I know some of you I've seen before and met in person, talked to, um, but uh, I uh, have been working with Unique Venues for over 10 years with some uh, SEO and paid search and, and various digital marketing capacities. Um, I'm really excited to talk about AI today and chat GPT. It's finally to the point where I think, um, you know, it's finally to the point where we're actually pretty comfortable, I think, using content created from some of these tools. Um, and I think it is a really good tool for businesses that maybe don't have a lot of people or are a little tight on resources or people that just have resources and want to be able to scale, you know, much quicker. Um, so there's a lot of great tools that are starting to pop up now. We're going to talk about AI um, in general, kind of what it is, um, where things are going, and uh, talk about uh, some of the tools that you'll be able to use in some of your, your marketing um, materials and help you do a, lot, a little bit more uh, with your website, social media, paid search, and various different places. So I see a lot of people commenting about where they're from. Looks like we have some people from Maryland, uh, Delaware, kind of all over the country. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, so let's get started here. So the first thing I wanted to kind of start off with, I have a couple slides that kind of frame, put a frame of reference here for us. Um, so this is, first one is a quote from Larry Page. Larry Page was one of the founders of Google. And he said this 23 years ago in 2000. Artificial intelligence would be the ultimate version of Google, the ultimate search engine that would understand everything on the web, and it would understand exactly what you wanted, and it would give you the right thing. We're nowhere near doing that now, 23 years ago. However, we can get incrementally closer to that, and that's basically what we work on. He's basically saying here that once, says that once AI has happened, um, that's kind of the ultimate version of Google. And so, you know, in retrospect, kind of looking back at this, they've made a ton of changes over the years um, to create ways for us to interact with Google and, and businesses and images and videos and get maps and directions and ask questions and all kinds of different things. This is all kind of leading up to where we are today. Um, and so now, you know, we have ChatGPT, we have GBARD, Baird, which is Google's answer to that. Um, so we have all these tools that are starting to kind of pop up and it kind of begs the question, you know, at some point, will Google be, uh, will be uh, obsolete or will they continue to um, be a part of our, our conversation and what we do for marketing? Um, the second quote on here is from just two years ago. Um, and this kind of speaks to where we're maybe headed. Um, you know, the real question is, when will we draft an artificial intelligence bill of rights? Does, does AI basically get so close to humans and start to influence us so much that we start to, um, you know, make it a much bigger deal in our lives and, and even get into legal questions, you know? So what, what does a Bill of Rights for AI look like and who gets to decide that? Maybe the AI tools get to decide that for themselves and tell us what they want um, once they've learned what's what's important. So. Yeah, kind of a little bit of where we've been and, and kind of a little taste, I think, of where we're headed. Um, so questions everybody's kind of asking is, you know, what is AI and how does it work? Um, in the most simplest forms, it's basically a set of rules that's been created by humans or machines that have learned to do a task. And over time, that machine or uh, the, the set of rules kind of uh, does its task better, faster, more efficient. It learns how things happen and learns what kind of information is out there and what's accessible and how to digest it. And if it does the task 100,000 times or a million times, AI essentially learns how to do it best. You know, how what's the best solution, the best uh, answer that actually does what we want to do. So, you know, asking AI a question, it's essentially looking at all this available data that's out there and coming up with the best answer. Um, we're gonna get into a little bit of why that is important around what AI's sources are, um, because that has an impact with what gets created. Um, and so this is essentially, you know, right now, you know, if you use ChatGPT or some of these others, they actually say this data, this information is based on data from a certain data point or uh, time frame uh, and back. Um, Google, 
is now starting to look forward. And I think we're very quickly going to be getting into kind of almost real time um, AI uh, and chat GPT uh, language being used. So here's a picture of a girl playing chess against AI. And this is an AI created image. Um, first thing I noticed is it's a little bit uh, dark and dystopian. Um, and so I wanted to bring this up because this is actually a little philosophical before we get started uh, and get too far into the AI discussion. I think this is worth noting. So we've created images and stories about artificial intelligence online for the past 20 years. And we've made movies about AI, you know, WALL-E, for instance, you know, Disney with uh, robots and all this stuff. And how do they look? They all kind of look dark and dystopian, gray scales, right? And so when we ask AI to create a story or an image about a girl playing chess against AI, this is the kind of story that we get back. Um, and so it really begs the question, you know, what stories and visuals have we created over the years as a society and a culture that are now going to be reflected back to us when we ask AI to create something for us? Um, and so just kind of a, a really philosophical thing to think about, how have we created stories about gender, race, different people, different places, and how is that going to get reflected back to us? I think we're, as a society, we're in for um, a, a big reflection period because we're going to get things like this that come back to us and we're going to say, hey, that's actually not what I want. Like, I want this to be a happy scene, but that's not what we've been portraying this as in the past. Um, so when we start getting into, you know, talking about specific people and cultures and things like that, how are we going to fix some of these ways that we've maybe um, inappropriate portrayed people, inappropriately portrayed people in the past? So this is just something to think about, you know, that, again, AI is based on available data. So this is, you know, a very stark example of something that got created based on that available data. And we have an opportunity to be aware of that and change that if we don't like what we see. Okay, so how can you use AI today? Um, I think there's kind of three ways that uh, venues can use AI. One is assets and creation of content. So creating new content, planning that content, and writing that content. Also image creation and some of the workflow management around that with social media and content creation. There's a lot of great tools now that are incorporating AI concepts into looking at data and understanding, you know, we all, we all used to ask the question, like, what's the best day to tweet or what's the best time to post a Facebook post? That all, all that data was there and available. Now we've got AI, tool, AI tools that are actually looking at that and making immediate recommendations for us based on our own data and the experience that we want to have with our customers. So some of that stuff's get, starting to get integrated. There's a lot of tools to, to bring that together. The promotion is also getting a lot better. Google in particular has always led the way in running really strong data-driven decisions with um, Google ads. And they you know, want us all to be using, use um, you know, conversion-focused metrics and, and basically kind of almost run on autopilot based on that data. So we're starting to get to the point now where we kind of create a scenario that we want uh, put the inputs in with advertising and let AI driven data start to make the advertising decisions for us. Um, you know, Google, and I'll just bring this up. Google is basically forcing everyone to move to uh, GA4, um, the next kind of iteration of Google Analytics. And I think this is, you know, preparation for um, a much larger usage of, of kind of core data sets. Um, it's going to be a little bit less visual and more um, almost database uh, style analytics that we're going to start seeing. And you're going to be able to create awesome reports from that. It's going to take a little bit of time to do that. But um, that's a, a step where I think Google's trying to integrate more as much more uh, as they can around like people scrolling down a page, that being a metric, people clicking on things, people interacting with different parts of your website. So it'll be interesting to see how that comes through. Um, so some promotion pieces, and I think we do have like really good channel management now, but I think with AI, you're going to be able to eventually say, you know, there's going to be a tool someone's going to create that says, look at my Facebook advertising, look at my Google ads advertising, look at my LinkedIn advertising and these three other places and figure out which channel is the best for me in terms of performance. 
and then create new ad copy for all the other channels based on this, right? That's kind of here. Um, it's happening. You know, it's it's uh, there's tools out there that are starting to do that. And then management. I think you know, tools for better managing relationships is is important. We're, we've the the bots, you know, on websites have been around now for a couple of years. Um, you know, I. It's a little annoying. Sometimes you go to a retailer and you start asking questions and, you know, you're not actually talking to a real person. They're just your questions are querying a database, essentially. Um, so, you know, that's going to evolve over time and, and be able to use actual AI driven data um, instead of um, just kind of querying a, a general database of, of information. Um, and then project management is another one too. There's a lot of AI tools that are using project manage that are being used in project management already, um, and sales as well. You know, Salesforce is is connected in with um, ChatGPT and OpenAI. Um, so a lot of these tools that we're used to using are going to incorporate some of this even further. I think project management is a great one because you know if you do, let's say you're a, you know you build websites for or let's, let's, let's use the example for a, a venue. You know if you have a event type, let's say a wedding that you have 50% of your business and you kind of know what the workflow and timeline of things generally looks like, AI is going to be able to help you with managing that project and let you, you know, kind of trigger trigger emails out to people um, for planning and, you know, get together with your operations team to let them know that, hey, something's coming up that needs a decision being made around. So um, some of those tools exist out there, you know, they're just um, in different forms. And um, so I think that's a good way for people to start using AI. So some nuances with AI content that I think are worth noting. So content, um, when you create content with AI, it's historically kind of sounded repetitive and not really written how we talk or type. That's changing a lot. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I've been more comfortable with using AI for marketing now. We're just seeing better content that actually sounds good. It's more, um, sounds more human. In a sense, it uses phrases that we use. It uses punctuation that we use. Um, you still need to edit the content, though, to make it really sound like your brand and be on point with what where you want to, you know, the, the call to actions that you want and different things like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I feel like AI content is about a 90% of the way there foundation. It still requires some some other layers of decisions around you know, things like using Grammarly to make sure that the content sounds even better, or you just going in by hand and kind of editing like um, the, the, the headlines or sub headlines of, of different content blocks. And also take note of where the source of that content is being created from. Um, I've seen AI content being written for a business that then looks at a competitor's website and talks about the competitor compared to the business and sometimes they don't come out in the you know the best light um the business doesn't so you know you have to kind of be careful to make sure that your content is saying the things you want i think people are um sometimes impressed with the first opening paragraph and say this looks great and they move forward with it and then at the very bottom it said hey you know if you want to find a venue um in portland check out you know the this venue um, but that's not the, the venue that it was supposed to be writing about. So you have to be a little careful with that. And then also sometimes keywords that we use and things that phrases and things, collections of information that we think um, should be connected um, or not connected, it just doesn't translate as well as we think. So I actually recently created a blog post about famous people that got married on Cape Cod, and it included Tom Brady. Tom Brady did not get married on Cape Cod. He's very heavily tied in with New England. Um, he got married in Santa Monica, but there were so many Cape Cod and New England websites that talked about his marriage because he's from the area um, that the AI tool actually used those as sources and thought that this was such a closely related keyword, Cape Cod, New England, Tom Brady, weddings, um, that, it, that that's where he got married. So that was kind of a miss, um, but you can kind of backtrack a little bit and see why that was a miss. Um, so just be careful with you know, those kind of things where you have a keyword that may be loosely related and all of a sudden it gets overwhelmed and too much weight from something else um, and starts to look different. Hey, so hey Scott, really quickly, I put a comment yes. in chat that I just wanted to, the other thing right now about the nuance of AI, ChatGPT, it has its own voice. 
Like in this day and age, you can spot something that's just been like 100% written by chat GPT and put out there. And just a really quick, funny story. Um, about a week and a half ago, I was at dinner with a friend and he's single and he's on a dating website right now. And he had to show me this chain of messages that he'd gotten from one of the people on there. And this was not a, um, uh, you know, a bot because people had to pay to actually be on the site and communicate with people. Uh, but it was very clear that in his communications with this uh, person that he was interested in, like every response that came back, the person had kind of just fed his message into chat GPT and it generated a nice response back. And so we went, we, we had a great laugh. I mean, I feel a little bad for the person out there, but it was like a hundred percent clear that like he had put at one point that it had been out hiking and he got a little sunburn. And so the next response back was like, oh, uh, sun cancer or cancer from sun exposure is blah, blah, blah. And you should do this, that, and the other thing. And yeah, and, and you just, I mean, it was just on, like every message. And I think it was either the person was communicating with so many people, they thought that was their strategy, or they just weren't really realizing that again, in this day and age, it was very obvious that chat yeah. GPT had written these responses, not the person that uh, they yeah. were engaged with. And that, that's a good point. So that actually speaks to like the weighting of information. Like if you create a blog post and you want it to be about the best things to do in a city, um, it might put too much weight into certain types of things like free things to go do, um, or it may just not even mention you're part of the city, right? So um that's just something to kind of be aware of, right? Like you, like cancer being a big deal, right? Like they shouldn't, that was, that got too much weight in the AI response essentially for that actual conversation to make sense. So yeah, that's a good example of that. Um, so Chad GPT, um, I'm assuming a lot of people here have maybe tried it um, or seen it. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that I think that it can be really well used for are creating blog posts, obviously um, pretty, Straightforward there, you can put a prompt in there and and, and let it create something for you. Um, how about business or profile page content? We always talk about, you know, needing, you know, your unique venues profile to be well built out. We talk about your Google local business profile being unique. We talk about all these places where your venue is being talked about or listed, having some unique content. Well, you can, you can use ChatGPT to create a new business profile, essentially, based on publicly available data. So um, that way it's just unique. Um, obviously it's it's gotta be pulling from uh, reputable places. Hopefully it's your own website, um, but that's a good way to kind of scale out some of these things um, to uh, make sure that they are, um, you know, all kind of unique. Um, another thing is, you know, I've, I've tried this and it actually works pretty well. Pull in information about reviews of your business from places like Yelp, Google Local Business, uh, Facebook, that kind of thing. Um, that could be kind of good, unique content. You can actually get like quote snippets in there that you can use. So I think that's pretty cool to use. Social media content, obviously, you can ask ChatGPT or some of these other tools to create a Facebook post about uh, an event being held at, at your venue or, or talking about events that have been held there in the past. Um, marketing plan ideas. I, I actually, I actually had, I, I had a friend who was trying to figure out what to do. Uh, they, had a, they had a, own a car auto detailing business. And I, I was like, well, let's ask chat GPT about a social media marketing plan for your auto detailing business. They put it in, they got, you know, five or six kind of sections built out of all the things they need to be in all the places. And, and even some examples of other businesses in their area that are doing, certain things on social media. So you can use it at least to get some ideas, um, at least get a starting plan. So um, so if your boss needs to, you to put together your next quarter marketing plan ideas, you can use ChatGPT to do that. Um, multiple languages. I tested this out actually just recently, um, you know, create a list of things to do in San Francisco that are in Spanish. Um, worked pretty well. Um, ChatGPT understands lots of languages. Um, and it's not just translating existing content, it's creating new content in that language. So that's a big difference. Um, you know, a lot of times people wonder if they need a Spanish version of their website or Chinese, you know, on the West Coast, a lot of venues tap into the Chinese travel market um, and Japanese travel market. So that's something that's, you know, useful to have on the site in some way. Um, but yeah, it's the languages are really kind of exploding with with the um, with the AI pieces here. 
Um, you can also create a list of prospects who are the biggest tech companies in my city, who are the biggest, you know, uh, medical related companies in my city, um, at least to give your sales team a starting place um, of, of companies to go reach out to. Now, some of the limitations related to this specifically are um, at this point, ChatGPT does not give you contact information for people. In fact, if you try to put it in and say, give me the you know, contact information for the top five uh, conference centers in Oregon, um, it's going to give you the conference centers back, but it's going to give you fake data around the people. So um, that is something that may change. Uh, there's a lot of tools, obviously, out there to get contact information. Um, so you could use business list names and then um, go get the contact information in a different way. And then um, another limitation here is that data is obviously from a certain time frame and it generally has to be known um, publicly. So if you're a venue and you've changed your uh, hours or the types of venues that you're trying or events that you're trying to attract, or maybe you're a university and you now have a new event space that just opened up, but that data is not publicly available yet, ChatGPT is not going to know about it until there's something out there that talks about it. Hey, Scott, you may be getting this later in the presentation, but Carla had jumped in kind of on the tail end of our last conversation saying there's likely a nefarious side to AI. Are there sites or things to be aware of? And again, if you're addressing this later, that's yeah. fine. But if not, are you? I, I, yeah, I don't have anything specifically to that, but I will talk about something that's kind of fun in our industry um, that used to happen and I can see it happening again. So there used to be this thing called Google bombing where basically you could take a keyword like the worst president ever. And if you type that in, uh, George Bush showed up. This, this, this happened back when he was president. Um, and so what a bunch of people did was created content about George Bush and sent a ton, like thousands of links to that content, made it look really authoritative, You know, basically started outranking the White House website for George Bush related keywords. And so it was called Google bombing back then. You're basically directing Google to look at information that's not kind of organically correct. And I think that's probably going to start happening with AI. People will start putting out content um, that maybe isn't correct. And maybe it's not uh, like malicious, but like, hey, let's say uniquevenues.com created a list of the top 10 conference centers in the country. And someone asked the question, that question, give me the top 10 conference centers in the country. And Chad GPT found it and included part of that list in their response. You know, again, going back to the source, I mean, this is all kind of driven by stuff that exists somewhere. So we have to understand where things are coming from. It, so that's kind of the big thing that I could see being an issue, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I could also say like on the, the imagery side of things too, um, creating images with some of the, the tools that are out there, people will probably start creating images of things that are not right or not correct or fake or politically incorrect and that's going to start showing up when when people try to use AI to create things so. it, it's the it's the artificial intelligence version of Wikipedia right because Wikipedia yeah. can be edited by humans and so we can do that uh, and make yeah. changes and make things look incorrect and have you know students go out and research that and put it in their report and write it that way and this yep. is the same thing is there you know now AI is pulling data in if it's not good data you get bad data out yep so speaking of that, um, so this is actually like a, re a research piece that was done a little bit ago. Um, how smart is ChatGPT? Um, someone literally put it through the test, like give me the verbal scores, the, the best verbal scores that ChatGPT was able to get for the GRE. How about the SAT? How well did it do? How well did it do taking a law exam? How well did it do taking AP tests, advanced placement tests for biology, statistics, psychology, all these different things. So in uh, lighter teal is ChatGPT 3.5, and then in blue is the ChatGPT 4.0. And this was just literally advancements made probably over six months. And the big difference here was um, allowing ChatGPT 4 to actually go out and have internet access and, and collect information that's more um, broad and more recent. Um, and then also looking at visual inputs and kind of general greater content length that it was able to digest and create content around. So you can see here, 
it's made huge advancements just in the last year. Um, we're going to probably see, you know, a version five coming out soon that's going to do really well um, and answer some of the things that are down towards the bottom a little bit better. Uh, my wife's a high school teacher, so I've actually tried, you know, some of her prompts that she has around, you know, uh, American politics and government and history and all that stuff. And I, I did try something with her back in December. She gave me a B plus on a paper that I wrote with Chat GPT, which outscored several of her kids in her class that are actually taking the class. Um, so, you know, teachers are aware of this. Academia is aware of this. There's going to be tools that figure out whether something's written by AI. I would say that's the one thing that AI does not do well right now is have opinions. It's it's based on fact. So if there's an opinion question being asked or opinion content piece that needs to be created, you kind of have to inject your own opinion or at least sway chat GPT with your question that you're asking um, to be a little more slanted on your opinion that you want to have. So... Um, another tool that I like is Jasper. This one's the kind of relatively inexpensive one. Um, I feel like this is probably the place that a lot of people have started once they've maybe learned about ChatGPT or even they heard about you know AI before ChatGPT because Jasper's been around for a while. The nice thing about Jasper is they have a lot of pre-built templates. So you can go in, you can see down along the bottom here on my screen, there's a lot of templates that are built. These, this is a small sample. They probably have 40 or 50 different templates. You can create blog post ideas. You can have them create Google Ads descriptions, Google Ads titles. Um, you could have them create unique personalized cold emails times 30 and then do a mail merge, you know, or in MailChimp and test out different uh, email outreach programs that you're doing and see which ones perform the best. Um, on the SEO side of things, product pages, titles and descriptions, all that can be pretty easily done. Again, it's pulling data from you know, a product page on your own website. So if your product description now is bad, it may pull something that's not that great um, unless there's some other information being listed there. So a good example of this might be, um, you know, uh, uh, pulling out information about like a venue size or uh, seating requirements or capabilities. Um, you know, if you're overshooting or undershooting for various reasons, you know, some of this information may, may be um, not as correct as you think. And then the last one on here is a listicle. So this is basically create a, a numbered list based of, of, of content pieces on a certain topic. Top seven places to go if you're attending an event in, you know, Portland, Oregon, uh, things to do. Um, top five event types that the South San Francisco Conference Center holds every year. And it maybe lists out those those um, event types. So I think you could easily use it to create some some kind of interesting pieces of content. This is probably the one that I think, aside from ChatGPT, this is probably the most useful one for everybody um, because the content templates are pretty well built out, and it kind of guides you through. Um, it's pretty quick and easy to learn and figure out things once you get going. You can even talk about the tone. You can put in um, who our, who our uh, audience is. So you could put event planners in there, right? Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can use this, um, I think, today. Another one is called Flick. This is more of a social media content creation and planning tool. It's kind of the next generation. Uh, we used to use like TweetDeck and Hootsuite and all these other tools. This is kind of the next iteration of that pulling in all the information, allowing you to, to plan things out and then assisting you in what comes next um, based on, on what the data is that they're seeing. They have a cool thing called an AI content lab, which actually helps you create like hub and spoke content lists that are built upon each other. So um, if you think of one concept and then um, you know five subtopics around that concept, uh, it can help you figure out what those topics should be and what kind of social media content you should create for that. So pretty cool tool. Um, uh, fairly inexpensive on here, um, but, a, but a good one if you um, have a team member that, that manages your social media. Okay, AI image and visuals. Um, check out this pretty sweet wedding venue on the right. This doesn't exist, but Mid Journey, one of the tools for AI image creation, created it. Um, out of the out of the out of the uh, thin air. So 
there are some tools to create really cool images um, that could be good for filler on your website, could be good for social media or blog posts. Um, images, AI image creation right now is, is still developing. It's not great. Um, mid journey for a while, uh, they just kind of got things corrected. We're putting, you know, six fingers on a hand or missing a ring finger, or if you're, if someone was holding a, an object, you know, the, the hand wrap didn't work out correctly. So there's just weird little things like that, that, uh, image AI is, is having to deal with and fix shadowing, um, and, you know, things I mentioned before around just like the style of images. Um, I have a friend right now that uh, is working with a motor, a large motorcycle parts retailer, and they're trying to create AI content around motorcycles uh, and images and creating like the V6 engine from like a Harley Davidson motorcycle and have it actually be correct with all the pistons and all that stuff. AI is totally failing at it. Um, it's just too complicated to put some things together. Another area where AI is just it is interesting to use, but um, you know, like you're, you may start seeing it in blog posts. Um, you know, companies that have like that sell shirts or some brand, they're trying to figure out how to use AI to create like basically a a a, a, a person wearing their product, maybe out on a hike. Um, so you know, if you're a Columbia sportswear, create you know, you might say create an image of someone out on a hike wearing Columbia sportswear shoes. Well. Integrating the brand onto the person and having it look correct is is pretty tough right now. But that's something that obviously is going to be happening pretty soon um, and, and do pretty well. Right now, a lot of the AI images that you're seeing people use on a commercial basis are people looking away into uh, the space so you don't see their face, but you still get the concept that someone's there doing something. Um, so an example here might be people at a conference um, or at a wedding. Um, if we had people in this photo, they probably would all not have faces and be looking, you know, uh, away from us uh, for it to actually look good and make sense. But, you know, this is obviously improving um, and can be something that uh, is going to probably advance here pretty quickly. <clears throat> okay. Uh, video and AI, two sites that I like. One is called Pictory. This is an AI video generator tool that allows you to kind of create high quality videos. Probably one of the best tools for someone that doesn't really have any experience in video editing and design, you can create a script and then the tool turns your script into an outline for video production. It's pretty straightforward. Um, these are really good for you know, creating explainer videos. Same thing with Synthesia. This is another tool that actually creates AI avatars. So that girl um, at the bottom is not real. Um, but she talks and she could be talking about your event venue. She could be talking about, you know, you could create a video specifically about wedding planning, conferences, um, summer camps, STEM programs, you know, all these different things. You could have a video specifically for each one. I think all the venues that are here today could probably create a, an AI created explainer video that you could put on your website and use that as your sales tool. And use that even as a way for people to just get information without necessarily having to contact you right out of the gate, or you turn it on to them once they've emailed you, you know, check out this video for more details on all of our event spaces, for instance. Uh, management and sales. Uh, this is a tool I use a lot. I think everyone here could probably use it. It's called Fireflies. It's an AI note-taking tool. Um, you basically add them as a person that attends a meeting on Zoom or Google Google uh, uh, Google Meetings or any of these others, and uh, it creates a transcript of your conversations for you. It's basically taking your notes, um, and you can also see who talks the most by percentage, uh, which is kind of funny to look at sometimes. Yeah, Joel, <laughs> I've got the higher percentage today, but <laughs> you can interject at any time. <laughs> um, and then also what I something that I actually find really useful uh, from a sales perspective is the sentiment. They actually will give you the sentiment of the conversation and show you points where things were really positive or negative or in between, um, happy, sad. So based on the words that people are using, um, you can get an idea of what was being said. I think this is a great tool for any sales team that's doing a demo um, because you can kind of run through this and, and it's got the notes of the person you're talking to um, or someone who's doing a, a kind of a discovery call with a new uh, event planner that wants to hold an event. 
you can get all that information um, kind of listen to, you, you can then go back and see the sentiment of their reaction when you say certain things to them. Um, also like any larger meetings to plan out an event, like let's say you have a conference coming up that you need to talk with operations and catering and the client, um, bring them all into a Zoom meeting, bring in fireflies, it'll create all the notes and then you can literally just copy and it'll actually create like a to-do list for you for different people if, if you set it up that way. Um, and it, you can literally send that off to all the different departments that you work with um, or different uh, kind of um, key players uh, that you're working with. Another one, totally different, Reply IO. Um, this is a tool for automating email messages and responses. So if your sales team is on vacation or you are a one person or two person organization and you're just not always answering your email within a couple hours, it could be a good tool for you to set up um, like responses based on what people send to you. Um, and uh, it's a pretty good tool for, for doing that. It's also a good like email initiating, initiating tool for um, outreach. Um, and then any, any like, it, you can actually pull in like uh, uh, data from other places like your social media channel and, and it'll pull that into your email and then send that out to people. Um, periodically, and you don't have to send the emails out. It'll just pull in the most recent post and send that out. So if you always did a post on Facebook on Mondays about something, you could set this up on Tuesday to pull the most recent post and send it out to um, prospects as kind of a way to highlight uh, events that are being held at your space. So kind of cool. Yeah, uh, I see Joel's keeping uh, the accounting on us here. So Jasper is about 40 bucks a month. Flix is $13.12 a month. I think it's in it's in euros. Uh, and Fireflies is ten dollars a month. So um, you know, if you look at a, a marketing stack of things, right, you're still on, under easily under a hundred bucks. Um, you could add in a few more and, and still be doing a lot with a lot of these tools. So, how will planners use AI? This is kind of interesting. So, I'm actually going to um, exit my screen here and pull up some examples of using this. So here's some prompts. We're gonna use, this is, so this is chat GPT. So compare the Mission Bay Conference Center and the Oregon Convention Center as if I were holding a conference event. And so here's kind of a real-time look at what chat GPT does. Um, and and I'll kind of talk through the things that are happening here, right? So they're they're recognizing the the name of the place and giving that a headline, giving you some kind of a, a, a summary of of where it is, what it is, where it is. They're giving you the location. They're talking about the facilities. They're going to talk about accommodations and different things, um, how to get there. So ChatGPT, for whatever reason, views these as the important things to talk about for that venue, right? Um, now they're going to tell us about the Oregon Convention Center and probably use the same format and then probably give us a summary at the end with, I would say, not an opinion recommendation, but maybe a if you want to hold this event, this is a good spot. If you want to hold this one, this is a, a good spot. But again, this is where ChatGPT and others just they don't have the opinion you know, piece um, to really tie all of this together where you might have to add in your own your own pieces yeah so but it, it like, sure does tell you what kinds of things should be on your website or, sure what, kind of, or what kind of testimonials you want to get from yeah planners or attendees to put on your website so chat tvt can find those things and put it in a response like that yeah that's a really good point so um yeah this is all yeah if you if you don't have information about travel and facility like the, it's st structured in this way then you're kind of missing out. And that's a really good point too. So Google and other search engines and all these tools like structured data. So we've all been hearing about structured data for probably five or six years. There's the schema markup, there's all that stuff. So that is in preparation of now us being able to use these tools to go collect structured data and have it actually be correct. And, and actually, Scott, I just thought of this as you were saying that. The reason it looks that way is because if you think about any major hotel chain's websites, um, travel, accommodations, meeting space, you know, those are categories that you see commonly reflected in their thousands of 
you know, shell templated mm -hmm. websites that they do for each property that they have in their chain, which is why ChatGPT, since it is saying a scale of 15,000 all presenting information that way, it's going to present it back, which means that, again, for those of us that are unique venues, maybe we don't want to, you know, act the same way as those uh, chain hotels do. But the reality is, is that they're always going to win in helping to describe the future for how these things are being answered, because they're always going to have the volume. And so doing this is also a good reflection to say, how can I model some of what they're doing, but then make my information better or still display my uniqueness in and around some of these standard things that people are going to be, that, that AI is going to look for and reflect and spit back out as it's doing these things. Yeah. And, and to that point, this is all based on uh, data that's available now. This is what people care about today or have cared about for the last couple of years and have built websites around in five years, you know, whether it's a venue or other things, what are people going to care about then? You know, how does, how does that uh, change things? I mean, I, I see all kinds of things changing, you know, I, I think it was Wells Fargo or someone is really going to start getting rid of retail banking locations. It's all going to be on your phone and maybe there's a place you can go deposit a check in an ATM, but they're moving away with those kind of things. So if you if you're a if you're a Yelp or something and you're talking about the biggest categories of businesses and you have bank, you know, ATMs and banking locations, you kind of have to change your nomenclature that's being used as some of these things change and go away. Um, you know, venues are the same way. You may have transportation changes that happen and you may have uh, kind of city related uh, event spaces that pop up and, and just different things. So, um, yeah, so here's another example. So what are the best cities to hold a STEM focused kids camp for the summertime in and where can I host the event? So, you know, ChatGPT is probably going to give us the top kind of hubs of STEM um areas and then maybe recommend some venues for us to uh hold an event at so sometimes you, you if you think about it these are kind of the big ones right um we're getting um you know seattle in there is interesting it's probably more tech north carolina is probably the kind of odd one here um it's not a big city but it's probably also pulling in from something around uh, well, it's, the technology it's the it's the research triangle, right? So Raleigh yeah. Durham, it's all known as the research triangle. So this is one where AI is missing the point just a little bit, but yeah. it's taking what it can find out there on the internet. Yep. Yep. So, you know, this is something that if someone was, uh, if you're an, if you're a, uh, uh, if you are a uh, kind of larger website like Unique Venues or some of these directory other websites that are out there or travel and tourism sites, you know, this would be a really easy blog post to put together. And, and I yeah. noticed it didn't really fully answer your question because it didn't really tell you any places yeah. to, to hold it. So it didn't make that connection. Yep. I'm going to do this one. This one's kind of cool. I, I was playing around with this a little bit earlier, so I know what some of the answers are on this. But this is something that... Um, you know, this is going to, if you think about where we're headed with results of and using Google, I mean, who can I hire in Portland, Oregon to help me host an event? Um, it's giving me my list right here. You know, this is taking the place essentially of Google local business. Um, it's taking the place of the map listings um, and kind of giving me an opinion on maybe who is good or, or good to use. I did do this before, so I got a different result. I'm going to actually stop generating here and show what my previous results were here. So I asked the same question, and it gave me, instead of a list of companies, it gave me a list of the types of businesses that I need to reach out to. So um, it did then give me the list of businesses, two of them, under each one. Right. So this one's a little bit of a different result than what we just got. Same prompt. Um, but chat GPT is kind of interpreting things differently um, each time that we use it. So, uh, you know, doing a, a prompt, a different type of prompt um, each time can yield different results, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool. I also wanted to share um, two examples of content. So one of the things that people are doing is they're going out and creating AI or uh, API driven chat GPT tools like Jasper. Jasper's kind of pulling in this information and they're stacking multiple things on it. So I have access to a, a tool that's like this that can, instead of creating 
800 words or a thousand words, it can create a 4,000 word article for you. Um, so this was the prompt I gave it. What are the biggest pickleball tournaments in the United States and where are they? And we have 13 pages of content. This is a massive article. It talks about pickleball in general, types of tournaments. There's a national championship, um, the different locations and divisions and how do you qualify? And then, you know, what are some of the bigger events? Um, you know, all these things that are happening. So this is a stacked piece of content that has multiple layers to it. Um, I'm going to bring up another one that's similar to this, totally different thing, but related to this audience, uh, corporate event planning trends for 2023, 12 pages, right? So these are the things that are influencing our corporate trends. Here's how technology is shaping corporate events, um, health and safety. Obviously, we're just coming out of the pandemic. This data is all out there. A lot of people have webs. This COVID information on our websites is putting it almost front and center, right? So this is a good example of what's going on in, in real world is, is driving the weight of some of these responses. Hybrid events, again, we're, we're kind of moving out of hybrid events. We have moved out of hybrid events. We offer them, but they're not the primary event type anymore. But still, that's the information that's out there. So it's pulling in some of that information. Sustainability and eco-friendly, another big one that's really popular right now. So we're getting that. Um, and, uh, you know, some different things here that, you know, you might want to build out. So this article could actually be, you know, this tool actually gives you the references of places that pulled information from. Um, so you could, you could go back and kind of tweak this a little bit, knowing where it came from. You could also break this up into two or three different blog posts um, or use it all as one, one piece. So this is the kind of stuff that's being created out, outside of Chad GPT and some of these other tools um, that is kind of a, a coming piece. So I want to bring this all back full circle. I know we have about 10 minutes, but um, we all care about Google. Google's still the biggest search engine in the world, you know, definitely in the US, the biggest one. Uh, ChatGPT and, you know, Microsoft are teaming up. And so there's a lot of changes happening. So Google has had to accelerate their involvement with AI in the last couple months. So they've actually started coming out with this new thing called search, uh, Google Search Generative Experience, SGE. This is Google's answer to bringing AI information and chat-based AI information into the search results that we all are used to. Um, so there's a couple different things that are happening here. Um, so this is the first one here. This is this is a, a screenshot of what Google's labs are showing that how they're going to bring in AI into um, some of our search results. This is um, you know absolutely driving us SEO people and marketing people nuts because it's pushing everything down even further. And it's kind of fulfilling one of Google's ultimate goals, which is to keep people on their website as long as possible, pull in information from all these other places and keep you there so that then eventually you'll click on an ad and, and they'll make some money. Um, there's definitely going to be some copyright issues, some access to content issues that come up from this. I've already started to see, you know, people starting to say, I'm going to block Google from crawling my website for the AI related pieces so that they don't just pull it in. Um, so there's definitely going to be some ramifications coming out from this that we don't know about. Um, here's another example of kind of some, um, pieces where it's pulling in content and it's, it's kind of bringing in groupings of information that uh, you know you may want to talk about. So this is kind of where Google's headed. Um, and again, I'll go back to Larry Page's quote. You know, 23 years ago, he said, "Our ultimate goal is to basically move to a world where everything is accessible and we know what you're talking about." And we're kind of there. Um, and so Google's, you know, potentially going to be obsolete in our minds, at least, you know, in some way um, in the next couple of years, if they don't keep up with what's going on. So um, yeah, so to kind of wrap things up, so the best ways that you can use AI right now, create some large scale AI written and human edited content, get some better, stronger social media presence without much time that's required, manage your team and your sales workflow a little bit better, and then just create some better assets, images, videos, downloads, and stay up to date with AI um, 
it's really been in the mindset of people now for maybe six to eight months. Um, if you're on the edge, you've probably been talking AI for a couple of years, but it, we now finally have tools available that everyone can use and understand. And it's empowering a lot of people to do a lot more with content. It's also creating a scenario where we're just creating lists of curated content that are eventually going to get recurated and more lists of lists of lists be created. So I don't know where that's going to take us. Um, you know, inevitably, we, if we just keep, keep creating lists of things that have already been created and referencing, you know, AI written content that was written a year ago, like it's, you know, the telephone game ultimate scenario here of stuff's just going to get changed over time. So we have to keep an eye on the the uh, authority and the source. And I, I will say, I think that's, you know, I have two kids. That's one thing that I think will be a paramount thing for them in education to learn is how to figure out the original source of something and whether it's trustworthy, whether I believe it, is it real? Um, the next generation of kids coming through, that's going to be something that they're going to have to to kind of uh, wrangle with. So um, that's about it. I'm wrapped up. If we have any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, Joel, if you have any yeah, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Uh, again, the the session evaluation poll is up. So if you have to drop off, please uh, take a minute and, and oh, I got, there we go. Uh, <laughs> take a minute and uh, uh, fill that out before you go. If anyone has a question for Scott last minute, either throw it in the Q&A or just put it in the chat at this point and uh, we'll make sure that we can answer it. Uh, you know, um, the the friend that uh, I had dinner with um, a, couple, a couple of weeks ago, the one that uh, had the dating site thing, uh, we were also playing around with it then, uh, and we were trying to get it to, uh, well, what we, we we got it successfully to do, we were doing, um, we had put in song prompts. So we would say, create a song about a guy going to buy all the ingredients to make fried chicken and do it as a country Western song. And then it would just spit like three or four verses and a chorus back out. And then we were like, okay, now change it to be a heavy metal song um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so then it would just update it and the, the lyrics would change and maybe even the number of verses or the, it would change in a way that reflected the new style. And the last one, I mean, we, we were at dinner in a restaurant. We, we almost fell on the floor laughing. We said, now update it and change it to, so that the person buying the ingredients feels remorse about what happened to the chicken. <laughs> so it comes back and it writes, it updates the whole thing about how terrible this person now feels about going to buy ingredients for fried chicken, but can't get over the fact that he's thinking about what happened to the yeah. chicken in the first place. And it was, we were just rolling on the floor. It is, oh, it's truly incredible to, if you have never played with it, um, that's funny. It, it is, it is, there are so many creative, funny, interesting things that you can do with it. Um, but it's, it's scary how fast it, it does this. And how true, I mean, it was a country song and then it was a heavy metal song and then it pulled great language and it, I, like things rhymed and like this could have been a, a, a kind of a jokes, like a weird Al Yankovic writing a song and you'd never know the difference. Hmm. So it, it's, there's a lot to pay attention to as this continues to evolve over time. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I've seen some, I've seen some examples too of people talking to AI and they want it want AI to talk back to them in a certain way, like uh, as if I were in a murder mystery or something. And and what happens then is the AI goes out and learns what happens in murder mysteries, huh? and it kind of starts talking like maybe they're going to be the one that <laughs> you know is is the the person in clue that everyone's trying to find, right? Like there's stuff that happens with AI that it learns how we again how we as society have you know talked about things and. And uh, AI picks up on that very quickly. So yeah. what you're talking about here with song lyrics of like things should rhyme, like AI knows that things should rhyme in songs. Yeah. There's a cadence to things. So, yeah. um, you know, that's stuff that AI is kind of learning and, um, you know, exponentially increasing its knowledge around. And yeah, I mean, we're we're at a point where we don't know whether stuff's created by a person or a computer um, and whether it's right or wrong. So yeah, it's exciting times. It's empowering a lot of people. Um, I've been cautious on AI and, and content written by AI, but uh, I think we are at a point now where we understand it enough to at least feel empowered and there's enough tools that can kind of let us do what we want to do. Yeah. And it, it's, a you know, it's definitely one of those things you have to weigh the stakes. So to, to write some social media posts for you that are pretty low stakes and just bang some stuff out so you're not wasting your time trying to do that, that's great. 
Um, yeah. I would not recommend using it to put together a response to a bid for an event at your venue, um, un unless you were really gonna just very much ask for an outline and then build it out or, or do some heavy editing to it. Because again, yeah. I think the stakes are much higher in that particular case and you wanna be a reflection of yourself and your venue when you do it. But there are lots of great ways that you can incorporate this technology into making your life easier and spending less time trying to sit there and crank some stuff out. Uh, yeah. It just needs to get done in process. And and some of you may have noticed at the bottom of the description for this webinar, it said, P.S., this description was written by AI. I put that in there. That was kind of fun. It was actually written by AI. And AI went out and figured out what kind of uh, webinar needed to be talked about. Uh, the topic should be for event marketing um, using AI technology. So uh, it saved me a lot of time and thinking about that gave me a nice outline. Um, so that was kind of a cool way to to introduce those of you that uh, noticed that to some of the AI capabilities. Yeah. All right. Well, I haven't seen any other questions come in. Uh, we've had a few people start to drop off. We're right about at the end of our time. Thank you, Scott, for your time today. This was hugely valuable. And uh, I'm, I know I'm looking at evaluations. Looks like most people got something really great out of it. So uh, glad that we could do that for you today. I will get the uh, slide deck out uh, to everyone so that they can have that for their records. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future Unique Venues webinar. Everyone have a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.